All right, everybody. We are going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for being here in the room. And for those folks that are online, thanks for joining us. Um, just a couple of reminders for folks that are online. We've been doing this now forever, but your camera, mics, and screen shares have been disabled. But if you have any questions around technical issues, please put them into the chat. And our volunteer, Rose, who's in the room, uh, will let us know that you're having issues, and we will do what we can to make sure you can hear and see. Um, you are also welcome to use that chat function to put any questions into the chat function for our speaker, and we'll get to them at the end. For folks that are in the room, just a reminder, please sign up um, outside this room. That's how we buy cookies for us all. Otherwise, I get in trouble and they think I'm buying them just for me. So if you could just sign up, that helps us keep track of our numbers and make sure we can get us all cookies and coffee. A um, couple things about a hybrid event for folks in the room. Um, we are going to ask if you have a question uh, that you raise your hand and either... Um, I'll bring you the mic or you can go to the mic stand up there um, so that when you ask the questions, the folks online can hear them as well. So um, we're very excited for our speaker today and we're actually setting up for a dual kind of mini series. And so uh, Bill is the individual who helped us put this together. So I'm actually going to hand the mic to Bill and Bill's going to introduce the next two seminars. Here you go, Bill. Thanks. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm Bill Chadwick. Um, today's seminar is the, as Cinnamon mentioned, the first of uh, two about the local landscapes and uh, geology in our part of Oregon, uh, sort of a geology doubleheader. Um, so today's talk by Marley Miller uh, will give us a broad overview of the landscapes uh, and geology of the Pacific Northwest and how they formed. And next week, our uh, geo doubleheader continues with a talk by Ricky Eady, uh, which will focus on the local geology and landscapes in Lincoln County. Um, <clears throat> so focusing into our, our local environment a little more. Um, his talk will be titled uh, Backyard Basalt, Volcanic Rocks on the Central Oregon Coast and Other Stories of Stone. So that's next week. Today, our speaker is Marley Miller. Um, <clears throat> Marley got her bachelor's degree in geology at Colorado College in 1982. And in fact, she and I were both geology majors at CC at the same time. We overlapped there. Uh, back in the day, um, she then received a master's and a PhD in geology from University of Washington. And she's been a faculty member uh, in the Department of Earth Sciences at University of Oregon since 1997. Marley's an accomplished photographer and has written several books on Pacific Northwest geology um, for a general audience, including the Roadside Geology of Oregon, um, Roadside Geology of Washington, and Oregon Rocks, <laughs> which is a guide to uh, 60 amazing geologic sites in Oregon. Um, She'll have all three of these books for sale after the talk, and uh, today she's going to talk to us about encountering the unexpected in the Pacific Northwest geology. So take it away, Marley. Thanks, Bill. Can you can you all hear me all right? Yes. Is that okay? Great. Well, I was just telling a friend of mine that this is the first time I've given a talk in front of a, one of my friends from college and how nervous I was that this better be a good talk. So um, <clears throat> we'll see. Um, anyway, I, uh, I, I got into writing these roadside books uh, about uh, 12 years ago um, through a variety of, I was in touch with people at Mountain Press Publishing and all that. And, and the first one I did was Roadside Geology of Oregon. And, and <clears throat> It, it was uh, quite the process, but um, I, I, I like to say how I learned so much, it was embarrassing uh, that I, the, all these cool things about Oregon. And um, I, I, I got so much help from all sorts of people. And one of my favorite stories is about my friend, Brigida, who I, um, <clears throat> we traveled all around Oregon together. And we drove about 5,000 miles together around Oregon while I was researching this book. And 
we had really different just ways of being. I, I mean, she was always so calm. She'd like stop and like look at trees and flowers and stuff. And, and I'd be like, let's go on to the next block, you know? And so we often had little bits of conflict, but we're still friends. But we had um, one moment that I, I like to um, convey, I guess, because it was just so representative and kind of funny is we, we pulled into a gas station um, in Burns, Oregon. And uh, I, of course, had my little agenda in the back of my mind. And she was driving and she pulled into the gas station and a little too slowly, but that was okay because um, we needed gas. And uh, she parked the car and, you know, they they're, they started pumping the gas in the car. And she says, I, I think I'll clean, I'll, I'll clean the windshield. And I'm like, that's great, you know, because we still need gas anyway. So we're going to be here. So she starts um, washing the windshield just really slowly. And, and I'm like, okay, fine. The still pumping gas in here. And, uh, and then the, the, the pump clicked off and, uh, and I'm like, okay, but she's still going really slowly. And finally I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, it looks great. It looks great. And she looked at me and she said, I think I'll wash the back windshield. <laughs> And that was just sort of, well, we're, I guess what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We're very good friends. Anyway, um, so I, I'm really thrilled to be here. And this is such a wonderful venue. And thank you all for coming. Um, I'm excited to show you my pictures and, and talk about um, the, the geology um, in the Pacific Northwest. And specifically, uh, these are just kind of my goal here is to kind of give an overview of the geology, but at the same time, point out some things that, that sort of came up while researching these books. The second one with Roadside Geology of Washington, I, I wrote with my, uh, had been my thesis advisor at University of Washington, Daryl Cowan. And so we were always talking about like, wait, I don't get how this fits in. So all these little issues came up as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for, there's a lot of unknowns here, as well as um, talking about just the, the, the really great geology that we have. So um, I guess I'll start with that. <clears throat> okay, so um, I guess everybody knows that we have these wonderful landscapes here in the Pacific Northwest. This is Bandon Beach, uh, where you can, at low tide especially, you can just go right out there and, and, and look at the sea stacks. We've got the um, Cascade Volcanoes in Oregon. Well, these are the, 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 the three sisters on the right, and then there's uh, Mount Bachelor in the background there in Broken Top. And there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole chain of volcanoes. They go from Lassen Peak in Northern California um, all the way up to, um, um, Mount Garibaldi near Vancouver. And so here's uh, Mount St. Helens looking upwards or northwards to Mount Rainier. And if you are up in the North Cascades, um, you know, there's Mount Baker there is a big volcano, but that has kind of erupted through um, um, older rocks that are intrusive igneous and metamorphic rocks that have were formed at some depth within the crust and have been uplifted and now they're being you know eroded and sculpted by these glaciers it's it's actually the most glaciated part of the conterminous US in the north cascades and you can go then east of there and it gets drier and this is this is looking into yakima valley in washington state and if you go down to southern oregon you get into the great basin basin and range kind of faulting and you get these these big uh, lake beds, that ephemeral lakes uh, called playas. Uh, this is uh, Lake Abert, and you can see as it's evaporating, it's leaving behind this, this crust, of, crust of salts. So Oregon and Washington have, you know, this amazing physiography, and it, it, it falls nicely into these sort of different provinces or, um, that you can see here in the different colors. And this is very convenient for writing those books because each province could be a chapter with a little introduction, then followed by the road guides. Um, but of course the physiography is 
largely dependent on the geology. And so here's a, a cross section uh, for, across Oregon. And I guess the main thing to notice here is that that heavy dashed red line, which separates the, the basement rock from the, the cover sequence. And um, so what I'd like to do in this talk is kind of skip around um, a little bit in the, in, the, um, in the basement rock and then talk a little bit about the, the cover sequence. So I'll start off by talking about um, Silesia and uh, the Olympic subduction complex um, up in uh, Northern Washington, and then um, talk about the edge of Paleozoic North America that we can see in northeastern Washington, talk about the so-called boring volcanics, which are around Portland, and then use that to, to, to start on the like sort of a field trip up the Columbia River Gorge, which I like to do because it's it's something that's shared by, by both states. And so along with that, um, I'll talk about the Yakima fold belt, which we can see really affects the the Columbia River basalt group, which you have right here in Newport. And so I'll talk a little bit about the Columbia River basalt group that's here on the coast, um, but save most of the, uh, the detailed stuff for the talk next week that, that Ricky uh, uh, Edie is gonna give. And, um, and then talk about the mid-Miocene sedimentary rocks that are in there that I think have this real, provide this real opportunity to, to learn a lot more about Oregon. And, um, and Washington, and then finish by talking a little bit about the, the Missoula flood. So there's a whole lot of stuff here. And all this is, is, is um, those, those last ones starting with boring volcanics. You can see all that stuff from within the, the Columbia Gorge. Okay, so here's cross-section across Washington state in sort of a general way. And here's the cross-section across Oregon. And you can see that they're really very similar. Um, the the underneath that um, a dashed red line on the Oregon cross section, the the so-called basement rock. That's all. Those are all accreted terrains that were added on to the edge of Paleozoic North America, um, starting um, probably about 150 million years ago. And same thing in Washington State. You can see all the accreted terrains and. Um, there's differences between the accreted terrains, uh, and you can also see there's some similarities in the, the in the cover sequence, but also some differences. So, the, but by and large, they're they're very similar in a way because there's still these accreted terrains against North America, and then they're um, uh, overlain by uh, various uh, volcanic and sedimentary rocks in in the so-called cover. And so I'll start with Silesia, which is the most recently accreted terrain. And one of its hallmarks are these uh, pillow basalts. They look kind of like pillows. So you can imagine a seafloor vent erupting a little bit of lava and it chills around the edges and, and it kind of becomes rigid there, but it's still you know, very warm and malleable on the inside. And so it conforms to the seafloor and then another blob gets piled on top of it. So you get these sequences of pillow basalts, which are typical of seafloor basalts. And, um, and then if you look at them in cross section, you can see these sort of radiating fractures. And, and these, are, um, these pillow basalts are, are, are um, you can see um, in a quarry up on Mary's Peak, um, just you know, back behind Corvallis. Um, Silesia is this gigantic accreted terrain. It shows up on the map there in purple, and it goes all the way from Roseburg in the south, uh, all the way to the north, uh, northern edge of the Olympic Peninsula and actually onto Vancouver Island. So it's a really gigantic uh, accreted terrain. <clears throat> and this oceanic plateau formed between about 56 and 49 million years ago. And it was accreted uh, between about 51 to 49 million years ago. So, um, and, and everywhere, uh, and it just, it's the, the basement of the, the coast range. So everything else, all those other colors and everything were deposited over the top or erupted over the top. But if you go up to um, Northern Washington, uh, up to the Olympics, 
Um, you can see more pillow basalts. This is on the Hurricane Ridge Road. And there's lots of pullouts. You can get out, you can go out, you can pet the basalts and, um, and, and, and get a really good look at them. And you can then keep driving through. You can see where the, um, let's see, the Hurricane Ridge. Let's see here if I can do this. Uh, the hurry, this is the Hurricane Ridge Road. And you can see it, it goes across uh, the, the purple here for the for Siletsia. And up there, it's called the, the Crescent Formation, but it's still all part of Siletsia. But you go through uh, there and then you get into the green here, which is the uh, Olympic Subduction Complex. And at the, that's at the top of the Hurricane Ridge Road. And uh, you can look out and you can see the Olympics. You can see Mount Olympus. And you can look at the rocks up there. There are these low grade metamorphic rocks, um, but they're metamorphic. And if you then drive down to the coast, you know, take this road and go back down to the coast, you can see that um, down there, you, um, you can still see more of this Olympic subduction complex, but down there is sedimentary rock. And you can see that it's deformed. The rocks are tilted up on end, but if you take a, close look at them, you can see actually they're overturned uh, because younger rock is, is sitting below older rock. And if you actually walk around the corner there, you can see that they're really quite deformed. Um, and, and so this is typical of what you might see in a, in a subduction complex. And then if you go around to, uh, this is a, a beach four, but if you go over to Ruby Beach, um, you can see more sea stacks. And if you go down and take a look at those, um, you can see that um, the, the, the sea stacks are made out of these submarine debris flows. And um, Daryl and I quite enjoyed looking at these things because we are picking out pieces of limestone in these debris flows. It's like, where did these limestones come from? And, um, and then we started noticing all these basalt fragments which we think were part of the crescent basalt or part of Siletsia. And that seemed pretty significant because if you look at a cross section here, you'll notice that Siletsia in purple is it's, it's juxtaposed against the Olympic subduction complex here by this fault called the Hurricane Ridge Fault. And uh, you'll also notice that Siletsia and sow crops are on the wrong side of the mountains from the coast. And so the, the only thing, the way that you could get Siletsia in these submarine debris flows is if the mountains had risen after those debris flows had been deposited. And so we've got an age or a, what's a pretty reliable age on the so-called Ho assemblage, which is this part of the Olympic subduction complex at 15 million years. So that's suggesting to us that the Olympics rose after 15 million years ago. So that way these um, metamorph or these basaltic uh, clasts can get included in with the, the debris flows. And it also corroborates this idea that uh, Mark Brandon and others had in 1998 that that Hurricane Ridge fault actually carried Siletsia a lot farther out over the top of the Olympics uh, when it was active. And what's interesting about that is it kind of explains this horseshoe shaped pattern that we can see in, in Siletsia around the, um, uh, around the Olympic Peninsula. So here's that horseshoe. And so if this, um, if this, fault brought everything out over the top. And then there was uplift afterwards that would kind of arch it over the top. And then as it eroded away, uh, you know, here's the present topography, it would leave behind this sort of horseshoe shape. So to just kind of summarize that for the uh, Siletsia in the Olympic mountains, we see class of Siletsia, the crescent formation in these hoe debris flows. Uh, which suggests that the, the uplift of the Olympics was uh, after about 15 million years ago. And we also see that these class, um, they, they also corroborate the, the idea that the Hurricane Ridge Fault just carried the Silet terrain a lot farther to the west than, than uh, we had, than, than a lot of people had earlier thought. 
Okay, so here's a map of the Western US and it shows the accreted terrains in different colors. Uh, the gray, the, 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 the mark shows the edge of the, um, the uh, North American margin at the end of the Paleozoic. So all the different colored terrains were added onto Paleozoic North America um, beginning sometime in the Jurassic. And, and so, and you can see um, there's Washington and Oregon, and you can see the Olympic subduction complex in yellow and Siletia in purple. And you can also notice that up there in uh, Northeastern uh, Washington, that um, there's a little bit of Paleozoic North America. It just kind of clips the side of, of Washington state. And it, it kind of raises the question, well, how do you know when you're standing on an accreted terrain? And most of the time you don't because you're up in the cover and you, you can't tell. But um, there is one thing that, that kind of helps um, show conclusively if you're on Paleozoic North America. And as an example, um, you can go to the Grand Canyon. Okay, so the Grand Canyon is located Oh, about up and about here. And, um, and there at the Grand Canyon, you can see Cambrian age sandstone, then shale, then limestone sitting on top of the basement. And these rocks re reflect uh, deposition uh, on North America as uh, the, the ocean was rising up on to North America. And we can see the same sequence of rocks um, not only in the Grand Canyon, but you can see it in many places in Utah. You can see it up, you can see it in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, uh, in Colorado. I taught for three years in, in uh, northern Wisconsin. Uh, we can see it there. And that's typical of North America, but you don't see it on the accreted terrains because the accreted terrains weren't there during the Cambrian. They were somewhere else. And so um, when you go to northeastern Washington, you can actually see the sequence of rocks. And I like showing this picture because it was just such a great place. It was always super hot when I was up there. And this is a nice shady spot just off the road. It's called Sweet Creek Falls. It's not the one down the road here near Florence. Um, but he, these um, the, the cobbles, here um, in the foreground are quartzite cobbles of what's called the Addy quartzite, which is a Cambrian sandstone, slightly metamorphosed to quartzite. And above that, if you, you know, if you were to follow this up the creek, you'd find outcrops of that. And above it would be outcrops of Cambrian age shale. And above that, which is now slate. And above that, you'd find outcrops of Cambrian um, limestone. And then this rock that the water is spilling over is Ordovician uh, Leadbetter slate. So we've got this sequence of uh, these um, these rocks um, in northeastern Washington. So that would represent Paleozoic North America. Oops, I keep going over here to change the the, the slide, but I've got a my little remote. So you can. Um, this is just a plug for probably my favorite road in Washington state. That was, those pictures are taken right about here, but you can get onto uh, Washington state 20 and you can um, start in North America. And then you can drive across Cornelia, which is then there's a photo shown in the middle there down here. And you can see a lot of deformed rock. And there's a lot of other things too along this road. And then you enter the North Cascades and all the different accreted terrains of the North Cascades and take a ferry then across the Olympic Peninsula and you're back in Siletia. So basically you can start in North America and you can cross all these different accreted terrains and take little, see little bits of the cover and along the way and end up uh, back in, in Siletia. So uh, like I said, Washington State 20 is just a, an awesome highway. So uh, as far as the accreted terrains go then, um, if you can see throughout Oregon, Washington, where they're exposed, you see them up Northern Washington like that. You can see them in the Blue Mountains. Um, there are certainly um, Siletia is exposed here in the Coast Range. If you go down to the Klamath, you can see accreted terrains of the Klamath Mountains. 
but the rest of the area is 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 covered by the cover sequence. And to talk about that, um, I'd like to talk about um, what we can see in the Columbia River Gorge, uh, and it, it's really very convenient because you know there's I-84 that goes up the gorge, and there's Washington uh, High, State Highway 14 that goes up the gorge, and you could just make a loop out of it to do a field trip, uh, going clockwise, clockwise or counterclockwise, um, or I'll just what I'll do is just kind of work my way back and forth as um, you know to, to point some things out. So here are two maps. Uh, that's not just one map. These are one map from the Roadside Geology of Washington book and the other from Oregon. So the, the Columbia River is not really that wide. Um, there's actually two Columbia Rivers on this picture. Um, and you can just um, kind of see that it's it's there's a lot of different rock units up there. Um, a lot of different geology, um, and but I want to simplify that by uh, just talking about a few specific things, um, talk a, a little bit about the volcanic activity. Uh, it dates all the way back to the early Cascades when the, the Cascades arc first started to form. Uh, we see that, the, and you know, we see the modern Cascade volcanoes, the so-called boring volcanics, the Columbia River basalt group, uh, and then there's even older volcanic rocks below that. Um, I want to talk a, a, some about the Yakima Fold Belt, uh, which is, um, you know, it, there's a lot of questions that that raises in my mind, but also it's very important as far as determining the overall shape of the Columbia River Gorge. Um, talk a little bit about the age of the Columbia River, how we know that it has to date back before 12 million years ago. Uh, and then that leads into talking um, about the, uh, the sedimentary rocks of mid-Miocene age, which we can see all over the Pacific Northwest, but they have different names. And then finally, uh, the Ice Age floods, which uh, you can see uh, impacts of in the gorge in, in some places. So here's driving up the gorge. You can choose to either take the interstate, and I think I risked my life taking that upper photograph, um, or um, the Washington 14 below, you can see is a much mellower drive. And you can see Mount Hood there. Uh, so I'm not really gonna talk about the Cascade volcanoes, um, but what I do want you to see is that mountain to the left of Mount Hood, uh, the kind of broad one, that's Larch Mountain, and it's part of the Boring Volcanics, which are not boring at all. They're named for the town of Boring, which is located right there. Boring, Oregon has a sister city in Scotland named Dole. Um, I guess it's a charming town. I went through it once and had a cup of coffee at the bakery. Um, but you can see all these different colors. Those are different uh, ages of the boring volcanic field, which are all basalts. There's a lot of uh, shield volcanoes and cinder cones. And you can see they range in age from, well, they range in age from about 2.7 million years old to um, I think it's 57,000 years old. And um, the, the blue colors are from, the, from two to three million years old. So those are the oldest. And they go up to the yellows, which are the, are the youngest ones. And um, you can see there, there's a lot of them in the, the Portland area. It's quite voluminous. And in fact, it, if, you, if you look around the Portland area, a lot of the topography, a lot of the buttes and everything are part of the boring volcanic field. And so these are the relatively quite recently erupted volcanic rocks that are very voluminous in an urban setting. So it's definitely something that we need to be aware of as a potential hazard, um, it, given the amount that has been erupted in the last two and a half million years. But they're also a little bit of an enigma because if you look at the plate tectonic setting, you know we easily understand um, most of the Cascade volcanoes because we have this idea of how the uh, Juan de Fuca plate is subducting, and as it subducts, it releases water. 
which then uh, causes melting in the overlying lithosphere, which drives the volcanic activity. But the boring volcanic field is off the axis of the Cascades. It's to the west over a shallower part of the plate. And so it's not immediately clear just why they're there. And there's different ideas about how it might be related to um, some crustal, local crustal extension because the plate's rotating or something. But um, I think this is still a real focus of why they're there and will they erupt again anytime in the near future. The youngest part of the boring volcanics is this beacon rock, which actually uh, the first time I went up there was with Bill. Uh, my brother got married in, in Portland and Bill came and rescued me. And we went for a hike up at uh, Beacon Rock. I think that was in 1981, maybe 82. Um, but it's 57,000 years old. It's the youngest part of the boring volcanics. And, and there's like a stairway that goes all the way up, has nice views of the Columbia River on the way up there. But the, the hills behind it are older volcanic rock, and they include the Columbia River basalt group, which you can see this is just taken a little farther up the river. Everything in this photograph is part of the Columbia River basalt group. Uh, and you, it's remarkable because you can follow individual flows for great, great distances. And if you're not familiar with the Columbia River basalt group, they're just, it's just amazing. It covers this whole area in Oregon, Washington, and even uh, Western Idaho. And uh, most of it originated as uh, eruptions uh, in the Eastern part of uh, Washington and Oregon. Uh, from these, these from fissures where these dikes are, and uh, and they cover um, this huge area. They float all the way to the coast, um, and so it, it just to, for some numbers, they erupted between seventeen and six million years ago, and they cover over two hundred thousand square kilometers. They have a volume of more than two hundred twenty thousand cubic kilometers, and I just can't process that, how much that is. But it, it helps to think that in the Grand Canyon, the National Park Service has estimated the volume of air in the Grand Canyon to be about 4,000 cubic kilometers. And so this has more than 50 times the volume of air in the Grand Canyon between the two rims. So a huge, huge province of basalt. And um, what's also amazing about it is that some 94% of it had been or was erupted by 14 and a half million years ago. So in just a couple million years, we had all that basalt just completely flooding the landscape. And it, fl it followed the path of the ancestral Columbia River. And so we see the Columbia basalt here in Newport. Um, this is Yaquina Head, which are uh, surface flows of the Columbia River basalt. If you go down to Seal Rock, which I think Rick, Ricky's going to talk about next week in some detail, it's actually an, an intrusive body of basalt, of Columbia River basalt. If you go up to Otter Crest, um, you can look down and you can see these dikes of the Columbia River basalt here. There's one of the dikes, and here's another one. So these are uh, have somehow invaded the existing sedimentary rock, the, the Astoria formation here. If you go farther north, you can see more of it. Cape Lookout are uh, lava flows of the Columbia River basalt, and the Akani Mountain is a gigantic sill, a big. I mean, it's you can see it. It goes from the sea level all the way to the top. It's a couple of thousand feet thick intrusive body of basalt. So. Here, all the browns are um, basically lavas of Columbia River basalt, and the reds are these invasive bodies of Columbia River basalt. And for quite a while, it was a real question as to how this happened. Um, but beginning in um, the late 70s and early 80s, people started really starting to understand. And, and this came from, um, this um, diagram comes from uh, Ray Wells and others in 2009, where they, they have this model for how you got these intrusions. So these lava flows were pouring down um, 
into the ocean and, and they, they flowed in, the idea is that they flowed into um, a submarine canyon and were able to get enough head on the basalt that they were then able to inject down into the existing um, sedimentary rocks um, um, through fractures and along bedding surfaces and so on, and then reinflate as, as basically as magma chambers, these thick sills, some of which then re-erupted or, or re-invaded uh, some of the overlying uh, sequence. And then in at least one case, they, um, they re-erupted on the seafloor. So you can find where they they first probably started flowing into the ocean, uh, such as like at Saddle Mountain up, up in the coast, northern coast range. You can see all of these fragmented uh, pillows. Um, and then if you go to Cannon Beach, uh, there's Haystack Rock, which is the submarine eruptive center. So Haystack Rock, this is just amazes me. It's, it's like this iconic Oregon landmark. And it's a, it's a submarine volcano that was fed from below by a magma chamber, that the magma chamber was actually fed by surface lavas, which originated in Eastern Oregon. And I mean, this is definitely a, a case of something, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, I think. Uh, at least that's the going model. And they, they've got a lot of evidence for this, the, the geochemistry, the timing, um, They've got. They've been able to map these things basically up the Columbia River. It's a very compelling, although pretty crazy story. Okay, so if we go back to the gorge, you can see all this Columbia River basalt, and it's not everywhere nice flat lava flows. In a lot of places, it's folded. So here you can see, um, you know, these slopes. See that the the layering in the basalt is is like this, and over here. So this is part of one of these big folds, and this is the the so-called Yakima fold belt. And um, here you can, uh, from this physiographic map, uh, you can see these ridges. These are the folds. These are these big anaclines in the Columbia River basalt group. Um, and so here's Toppenish Ridge, which you can see this is the sort of downslope side of the anticline, and then it folds over the top. And there's Toppenish Ridge right there. Um, so we've got this, fold belt of these big folds in the Columbia River basalt group. And I think everybody agrees that they're somehow related to rotation of um, or Western Oregon and Western uh, Washington rotating against a more stable part of those states. And that sets up these compressional stresses, which then cause the uh, folds in their coring faults to form. So here's the, the Yakima fold belt. But then I start thinking, well, wait a minute, what is the Yakima fold belt? Because if you drive all over Washington and Oregon, you start seeing folds everywhere of about the same age. And, and so this is hardly at all restricted to that area that I showed you on the last map. There, these fold act, these are just the, the the crests of various folds that are all about the same age. And it, it makes me wonder, well, what is this Yakima fold belt? And so um, you can go up to um, the up near Cooley City and you can see a, a, a fold in the, the Columbia River basalt group um, near Clarkston, Washington. Um, you can see a big fold there. And, and then in the lower left, uh, by Picture Gorge, Oregon, on your Dayville, the John Day area, there's a big fold, big fold there, um, and just sort of all over the place. So, um, for me personally, I'm often wondering about this: that what is the distribution of these folds? How do you define it? And what about the timing? Because they didn't they definitely did not all form at the same time. If you go back to the Ellensburg area, um, there's the Yakima uh, River Canyon, and there's this big overturned anticline um, um, on Umtainum Ridge. And the people that have studied this have figured out that Umtainum Ridge and the, the, the nearby anticlines, they're all active. And they actually are deforming at about a half a millimeter a year. And so that's one that's active, but if you go back to the Columbia Gorge, you can see this um, where you've got um, these um, 
tilted Columbia River basalt group, which are about 15 million years old, and they're part of a fold, but they're overlaid by this flat two million year old cascades, high cascades related basalt. So this means this fold is no longer active. It hasn't been active for at least two million years. So there's definitely a lot of room here to try to suss out these different, these different folds as to what is active, what isn't, and try to understand the timing uh, a lot better. <clears throat> and this place I think is especially significant, mile post 57, because you can look across and well, here's the milepost, which by the way, you can see this whole thing on, on uh, Google Street View. It's kind of amazing. You don't even need to go there. Um, but you can see that the basalt is still dipping to the south. It's all part of the same fold. And this is an area called Mitchell Point. And um, so here's a, a better picture of it. You can see the Grand Ronde basalt, which is the lowest part of the Columbia River basalt. And then up there, Saddle Mountains basalt, which is actually a much younger part. And if you kind of hike up there, you can see that there are these uh, river gravels. And these are Columbia River gravels of um, what's, what's called the, the early part of the Troutdale Formation. Well, this is significant because it tells you right away that the Columbia River had to have been there at least 12 million years ago because it's sitting underneath that 12 million year old basalt. But what's more is if you get a kind of a different view, or if you were to walk up there, you can see that there's one that these river gravels are deposited against the Wanapum basalt, which is also part of the Columbia River basalt group. And this is like the side of an old canyon in uh, that was carved in, in the basalt. So this is telling us a, a bunch of things. Uh, so just to try to summarize them, that these gravels, they, they demonstrate the antiquity of the Columbia River right here in a very direct way. Um, but we also see that because they were deposited in a canyon, that suggests that there was uplift prior to about 12 million years ago. Maybe or maybe not that that's related to the Yakima fold belt. But if that's true, that would make that a much older fold. So we've got these gravels that are about that are older than 12 million years old. And uh, we look and go all over the Pacific Northwest and we can find other rock units that are sort of within the um, Columbia River basalt. Um, so it, during quiet times and eruptions of the Columbia River basalt, we've had sedimentary sequences deposited. There's the Ellensburg Formation in, in uh, Washington State, the Latah Formation near Spokane in Washington, the Vantage Horizon, um, southwestern Washington, uh, the Maskell Formation near John Day, the Simtustis Formation uh, near Lake Billy Chinook, uh, Sandstone a Whale Cove just up the road here. These were all deposited within the Columbia River basalt groups all at about the same time. And nobody is, has really looked at these in any detail collectively since the early 90s when uh, Gary Smith was working on, on some of them. Uh, but it's a really important time. This, uh, during this time, we had the Columbia River Basalt Group eruptions going on. We had the uh, early Yakima folds uh, were forming. Rhyolitic calderas were erupting in southeastern Oregon. We had arc volcanic activity uh, in the Western Cascades and then starting to transition to the high Cascades and then the nascent coast range. The coast range was starting to, to rise about that time. So we have here a sedimentary record where you know, these rocks are, were, are, they recorded what was happening at the surface. And it seems to me that it's a, a, a real opportunity to kind of pull things together. Now here, you're looking up the gorge, um, and I always forget the Cape Horn, I think is what it's called, the, this viewpoint. Um, you can see uh, Beacon Rock all the way up here. You just get a sense of it. You just see a little bit of it. 
Um, but you also can see how asymmetric the gorge is here. It's really steep on the northern Washington, uh, northern side of Oregon, and it's much gentler on the Washington side, which is one reason why, you know, the interstate, well, the interstate's pretty crazy anyway, because people are driving really fast, but it's, it's, you know, it's a narrow zone, and you've got these soaring cliffs above, and Washington 14 is a much uh, mellower drive. Uh, it's still fast, but there's a lot of pullouts, and there's a lot less traffic. But the reason that the Washington side is so much gentler is that uh, it's prone to really large landslides. And in fact, this is a landslide you're looking at. This is the head scarp here. It's called the Skamania landslide. It goes all the way from here, all the way almost to Beacon Rock. And this rock in the middle of the, the river is actually part of that landslide. And there are a lot of these big landslides on the Washington side. And the reason is that the rock is tilted to the south because it's part of these, this Yakima fold belt. And so because it's tilt, tilted to the south, the rocks on the north side of the river have somewhere to slide, but the rocks on the south side of the river really have nowhere to slide. They, they, they can't slide down their bedding surfaces. You do get landslides on the south side, but nothing like you do on the north side. Um, and that's, um, that effect is enhanced because when it rains, the water can soak through the Columbia River basalt through the fractures and it gets into the the, the Eagle Creek Formation in blue, and it can pool at the top of the Ohanapakash Formation here, which is the beginning of Cascades volcanic activity. Um, it can pool at the top of there. There's like an old soil um, deposit that's impermeable, and and that then that can kind of float everything a little bit and cause the landsliding to to even be more extreme. So you have both those things going on. But it's also be, the main thing is that it's tilted south towards the river, and so you can get that sliding. And um, here's a view of the Bonneville landslide, um, which is only about 600 years old. You can see um, the Bonneville Dam uh, just down the river. And so this, and here's the Bridge of the Gods. See, and this gave rise to the Bridge of the Gods legend because when this uh, landslide took place. Uh, again, on the Washington side, you're looking north, um, it, the, uh, it, it dammed the river. You could walk across the Columbia River uh, without getting your feet wet. You can see it actually has moved the channel a little bit to the south. But it, by blocking the river, it dammed it. And so the river backed up as this big lake about as far as uh, Tri-Cities area. And then it broke through the dam and then flooded downstream. It would have flooded downtown Portland to a depth of about 20 feet. Um, and, and all this took place about uh, 600 years ago. But that's nothing compared to the Ice Age floods, um, which started because of a failure of a, an ice dam um, that, that caused Glacial Lake Missoula to form. Here's a view looking at Vista House at Crown Point. You can see Beacon Rock in the background. And the largest of these floods would have crested about 100 feet above Vista House. So you can just look at this and imagine the size of those floods. And um, for those of you not familiar with them, um, they, they form because um, during the, the towards the end of the, 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 the ice age, the, um, the Cordilleran ice sheet had these various tongues kind of protruding into what is now Northern United States. And um, over here um, in uh, Northern Idaho and Northwestern um, Montana, this, this low blocked the Clark Fork, which is a river that drains um, northwestern Montana. And the, it, it caused this glacial lake Missoula to back up and form. And if you look at the scale, this is over 100 miles from here to Missoula. And then it goes down the Bitterroot Valley. And to really get an idea for this, the scale of this lake, this, this is a view in um, Missoula. And 
And you can see these horizontal lines on the hillside that are uh, strand lines from Glacial Lake Missoula. And they are, they're over a thousand, the upper ones are over a thousand feet above the valley floor. So this is a big lake over a thousand feet deep all the way down in Missoula. And it eventually broke through the ice dam. And then the, um, the, the floodwaters coursed through northeastern Washington, created the, the channeled scablands and all the coolies. You've heard of Grand Coulee. These are big canyons without any present day rivers in them. They're just these dry canyons. Uh, and then came down and sort of coalesced into the Columbia River. Um, and in a few places backed up as these big lakes where uh, it came into constrictions in the channel, like right here going, entering the gorge. Uh, let's see up here at uh, Kala, uh, Wallula Gap, it backed up a, a lake to uh, almost as far as Yakima. And then um, here at Kalama Gap, it backed up all the way down uh, to Eugene. On the way, it uh, created scablands where you can just imagine these floods coming through. They tore up all the topsoil, of course, but they also tore up a lot of the, um, the bedrock and just kind of left these um, scabby areas uh, behind. And a lot of gravel deposits, and which many of which are, are being mined. Um, some of the gravel is the Spokane Aquifer, is made aquifer in Spokane, is, are in these uh, Columbia, uh, um, sorry, Missoula flood gravels. So you can see more in the Columbia Gorge, but this is kind of a lot of it. And um, you can use all that to create a little cross section to just kind of kind of lay out the geology, you know, early cascades, volcanic and sedimentary rocks, which I really didn't talk about much in blue. The Wanapum basalt and the Grand Ronde, those are the uh, part of the Columbia River basalt group um, with inner beds of those Miocene sedimentary rocks in the gorge called the Troutdale Formation. Um, boring volcanics, cascade range volcanic rocks, there's ice age flood features and landslides and so on and see the, the basic geologic history. So um, here you can, these are kind of the main points I wanted to make about the gorge um, where you've got all these different things, including you know the volcanic activity, Yakima fold belt, age of the Columbia River, ice age floods. But if you compare this cross section to the, the sort of more regional one, you can kind of have more perspective on the whole region and um, you know, for one thing, you can just see how the, the 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 Columbia Gorge fits in to the the whole region. The Columbia Gorge that I've been talking about is pretty much kind of centered around here, and it crosses part of the Cascades. Um, but you can also see that it's you know it's a really a small area compared to all of Oregon and Washington, and and there's that whole all that complexity and all that information from just a small area. And you can see just how far it goes. It did, we didn't even see the, you don't even see the basement in the Columbia Gorge. So there's just so much more there to, to learn about. And, and as a case in point, um, here's Crater Lake. Uh, it formed because um, Mount Mazama, which was a stratovolcano of the high cascades erupted some 7,700 years ago. It was such a catastrophic eruption that it emptied its magma chamber and collapsed downwards. And, and then there were later eruptions that made Wizard Island. You can see it filled up with water. It's, it's I think, the seventh deepest lake in the world. Uh, it's nearly 2,000 feet deep. It um, became a national park. If you were to go there, you would... Um, get to know it in your own way. You'd see all these really cool things and and um, it, it has its own complexity and it's got a geologic history that goes way back before um, the eruption of Mazama. Mazama has had a history that has a history that goes back over 400,000 years. And, and it's relatively young compared to some of the surrounding volcanic activity. And that's just one part of the Cascades, which are represented on this cross section by that little pink triangle at the top. And so you can see it goes on and on. And I, I think personally, that's 
one of the things I just love about, you know, working on books like this is that I, I get to see so much. And, and the more I learn about it, the more these stories expand and with all these more questions and it just sort of goes, goes on and on. So thank you. I'd love to answer some of your questions and um, I hope you enjoyed the show. Okay, I'm gonna turn up the lights just a little bit. And we're gonna just go back and forth between folks in the room and folks online. Um, I'm gonna start to see if there's any questions online. Okay, for folks online, if you get those questions in, we'll work through them um, and I'll come around and bring the mic and you all get to hear me running around. Uh, you were mentioning about Haystack Rock, and is Elephant Rock down at Seal Rock similar? Is is an intrusion kind of a thing? It's yes, yeah, Seal Rock is is part of a big sill, and if you go down, there's a place where you, well, you can see the basalt is on on top of the Astoria Formation there, and you can see nice vertical columns in it, um, and those columns typically form perpendicular to the cooling surfaces. So the idea is that it's a big sill that is intruded uh, into the, the, the rocks there. And there's one place where you can actually see a little tiny intrusion of the much bigger sill into, um, into the surrounding um, sediments. And then if you go a little bit farther south, you can see um, other dikes and, and intrusive things. And I'm, I'm sure Ricky's gonna go into some detail about that. We corresponded last week and, and uh, he, he has some really cool pictures of some of those relationships. Nice. Uh, questions online. Okay, questions in the room. John, I see you up there, hang on. <laughs> Uh, thank you for um, sharing that with us. Um, th these are really naive questions, but is the two things. One is that the continent, is it getting bigger because of this subduction? One question. And the other one is, why are these major geological formations like the Silesia, the Franciscan, the Klamath Blue, why are they different? How are, aren't they coming? What is their source? Oh, the, of the accreted terrains? Yeah. Um, well, I think that's a <laughs> that's an ongoing question. I think I think Silesia has been is pretty well understood that it it likely formed um, as this big oceanic plateau, so somewhere off the coast. Uh, some people are arguing. I mean, if you look at a um, like a, a I guess a a map of the seafloor um, farther north. And to the west is the Shotsky Rise. And I think some people are arguing that it might be sort of the other side of that. Um, and, and that, that was, it was added onto the continent. But um, Ray Wells, who's at the USGS, is um, lately, he's also the guy who, who figured out this stuff about, or he's one of the people who has been working on the, the invasive relations with the Columbia River Basalt. But he's been advocating um, for about the last 10 years that um, these that Silesia actually was the, the onset of the Yellowstone hotspot, which is one reason it's so big that this hotspot was sort of coincided with a, um, a, a spreading center in the, in the um, East Pacific. And, and that's why it was so uh, voluminous. So that would be Silesia. Now the other ones, there's all sorts of um, work that's been done on those, and and like you know, if you in the Wallawa Mountains, some of it that um, the Wallawa terrain probably originated as an island arc complex. Um, so just something like Japan, for example, that was then as subduction continued, it was uh, added onto the North American continent. Um, so there's a lot of, um, as far as specific locations where they might have formed, I, I 
couldn't tell you that, but the sort of environments that they could have formed, they're, they're typically all oceanic environments like island arcs, oceanic plateau, um, and, and, and sea mounts and things like that. As far as if the continent is expanding, I would say, yeah, when as, as new material gets added on, that's how the continent has grown through time. So actually it goes way back. You know, I talked about the edge of Paleozoic North America, but even um, if you go back further, the, there's sort of, um, North America has kind of been added onto around the edges through time, various mountain building events. But we'll probably have to wait a long time for it to, to really, you know, for the next event. All right, we've got a question online. So go ahead, Rose. Um, Beverly Beach has very interesting sediments in the beach that emerge when the sand is swept away. Layers of rock filled with fossils alternate with smooth sediments. Um, can you tell us more about those? Oh, so just north of here at Beverly Beach, this the the I, I'm pretty sure that's the Astoria formation. And Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, and yeah, there are some great little uh, I mean snail fossils in there and stuff. Um, and the Astoria formation was in part contemporaneous with the Columbia River basalt, but mostly a little bit before. And so that was one of the main rock units that was intruded. Oh yeah, now you're on. <laughs> um, just to add a little piece to, uh, to to your answer to John's question. So yeah. yeah, so we've got the subduction zone offshore, right? So the Pacific Plate is converging with North America, and it's sort of like a conveyor belt bringing stuff to the continental margin. So most of the time, if it's just the plate, it's going under the edge of the continent. But if there's a seamount or a or a plateau or something big on it that can't go down the subduction zone. So it gets scraped off and added to the edge of the continent. So that's how that whole uh, accreted terrain story is thought to be thought to happen. But um, another thing I wanted you to explain, Marley, was uh, so explain how uh, Columbia River basalts can be at Yaquina Head and the coast range is there. Oh. separating the rest of the Columbia River results. How did it get there? Because well, that's a pretty wild story too. Yeah, it'll be interesting if, if Ricky says the same thing. But my understanding, like if you go to Silver Falls State Park, which is just east of Salem, um, there you can see uh, these flows of Columbia River basalt that are actually, you know, it's a lot farther south than where the Columbia River kind of heads north out of Portland. Um, and those are in these canyons um, and they seem to be basically flowing. And you also see it in the Salem Hills, Columbia River Basalt Group. And so what most people have argued is that there was a route, there was this, another route to the coast. It didn't all go down the Columbia River, but a lot of it also came basically more directly from Salem, the Salem area to here and flowed over what is now the coast range. But if that's true, then the coast range couldn't have been there at the time, at about 15 million years ago when both the Grand Ron and the Wanapum basalts and, and also the Saddle Mountains basalt, the, the early Saddle Mountains basalt, uh, when, they, when they flowed over here. So um, the idea then is that the coast range has risen since then. And there's other things that, that indicate that too. Then the coast range rising, it removed all the evidence. <laughs> uh, as it rises, it eroded. And so I don't think anybody's found any remnants of Columbia River basalt group up in the coast range. And one time I was at um, Yaquina Head and I was looking at some gravels and I was thinking, oh my God, maybe there's basaltic cobbles in here that kind of washed down and maybe we can find them in some some sedimentary rocks that came from the coast range, but that didn't play out. But um, I, it would be really wild if somebody were to, to find real concrete evidence, but it, it seems pretty good uh, indirect evidence that, that there was a route from the pretty much the, the um, Silver Falls and Salem area to um, 
you know, probably a little north of here because you can see the Columbia River basalts up at, as, you know, certainly up to Depot Bay and, and to the south. And there's a lot of really interesting relationships that Ricky will talk about on Friday between the basalt, the lava flows and the, and the sediments that it invaded. Okay, everybody, we are pushing time, but I'm gonna take one more question for those online. And then for folks in the room, we'll have a chance to check in um, with our speaker because you're all here. So one more question online, Rose. Um, so what do you think is causing the rapid uplift of the Olympic mountains? Well, it's the, the it's it's related to the subduction because you've got the one if you could play subducting up there. Um, and I mean, what's preserved is that accretionary wedge, which is the the kind of wedge shaped body of sediment that gets scraped off and and uplifted. And right up there, the 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 plate margin kind of takes a bend. It's kind of it's not kinked, but it the the plate margin has a bend. So it's subducting down in kind of a weird geometry. And I think that's probably what causes the rapid uplift in and the preservation. All right. I know we have more questions, but everybody, I just want to thank you for being here. And let's give one more hand to our presenter. And if you're interested in book sales, come take it out. All right, everybody, we'll see you next week. For everybody online, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you for being here. See you next week.